the dynamic brakes or air brakes, which retard or slow the train. You must remember the retarding force is highest when the dynamic brake is used between 20 and 25 miles per hour. This force gradually reduces at speeds above or below this range. Now, on the other hand, retarding forces from an air brake application gradually increases as speed decreases. The weight of a freight car or locomotive is transmitted to the rail by the wheels. The force that is created by this weight is called vertical force. Vertical force is necessary for adhesion. Adhesion is a term used to describe the capability of the wheel to hold to the rail without slipping or sliding. Lateral force is the force generated between the wheel and the rail and at a right angle to the vertical force. It is lateral force that causes the wheel to follow the rail around a curve. In general, the wheel flange transmits lateral force to the rail and the wheel tread transmits vertical force. Lateral and vertical forces between the wheel and rail are measured in pounds of pressure. By dividing the lateral force by the vertical force, you'll come up with a ratio called L over V ratio. This ratio can be used as an important indicator for potential wheel climb, track structure shifting, or rail turnover. If lateral force exceeds vertical force, the wheel may climb over the rail or the rail may turn over. Provided that the car or locomotive is not rocking or bouncing, the vertical force of a wheel on a rail is basically constant. For a rail vehicle on straight, level track, the vertical force of each wheel is equal to the gross weight of the vehicle, divided by the number of wheels. The vertical force for each wheel of an 80-ton boxcar is calculated by dividing 80 tons, or 160,000 pounds, by eight wheels. Assuming the load in the boxcar is evenly distributed, the vertical force for each wheel would be 20,000 pounds. The lateral force of a wheel on the rail varies greatly depending upon conditions. On straight level track, there is relatively little lateral force. In a curve, lateral force is affected by such factors as the amount of drawbar force, the degree of curvature, and speed. Let's look first at how draw bar forces, draft or buff, can create lateral forces in curves. When a train is being pulled up a heavy ascending grade, high draft forces are present at the front or head end of the train. The draft force is highest between the couplers of the rear locomotive in the consist and the first car in the train. The force reduces progressively towards the rear of the train. Now, assume there's a sharp curve on the ascending grade. As the head end of the train proceeds around the curve, the draft force acting through the couplers attempts to assume a straight line. This exerts lateral force on the inside rail of the curve. The term string lining is used to describe the tendency of cars to pull to the inside of the curves, attempting to approach a straight line due to draft force. If the lateral force exceeds safe limits, the inside rail may turn over or the wheel may climb the rail resulting in a string line derailment. Now let's consider the opposite situation and look at the lateral forces created by buff force between the couplers. Assume your train is on a descending grade, using only the dynamic brake to control speed. The locomotives are retarding the speed and the weight of the train is pushing against the locomotives with the head end cars. The highest buff forces will be concentrated at the head end of the train decreasing progressively toward the rear end. While the couplers are arranged in a straight line, there will be very little lateral force generated by the buff force. But as the train proceeds around a curve, an angle will be introduced between the couplers and the center sill. The buff force acting through the coupler angularity will exert lateral force on the outside rail of the curve. These buff forces in a curve create a tendency for the train to buckle or bow out. If buff forces exceed critical limits, the result will be jackknifing if the outside rail turns over or if the wheel climbs a rail. In addition to buff and draft drawbar forces creating lateral forces in a curve, there are other sources of lateral force we should also consider. Now, let's consider first the forces created as a single car or locomotive moves around a curve. A train is made to change direction by introducing curvature into the track. The rail on the outside of the curve guides the wheel and truck by resisting its tendency 
to go in a straight line. As the leading wheels enter the curve, the outside wheel flange is in contact with the outside rail. Lateral force is created as the outside rail guides the wheel and begins turning the truck. As the truck turns and the rear wheels enter the curve, the axles shift relative to each other and the outside rear wheel is also pressed against the outside rail. The rail continues to turn the truck and normal lateral force develops. In order for the wheels to position themselves as described, they must slip sideways or laterally as the flanges move toward the outside rail. This action creates friction and contributes to the development of lateral force. The wheel flanges pressed tightly against the outside rail create friction, which tends to lift the wheel and also causes the inside of the ball or cap of the rail to wear away. Rail cars and locomotives traveling around curves are also affected by centrifugal force, which exerts an outward force and tends to overturn the vehicle. This outward force is transmitted to the outside wheels and also contributes to the lateral force. This is why the outside rail on curves is elevated. The curve elevation, called super elevation, causes some of the centrifugal force to be exerted downward, contributing to the vertical force at the wheel. The lateral force exerted on the outside rail of a curve caused by centrifugal force does not increase in direct proportion to the speed, but rather in direct proportion to the square of the speed. In other words, if at 20 miles per hour a car develops 20,000 pounds of lateral force, then at 40 miles per hour the force would not double but would be four times greater or 80,000 pounds. Even minor overspeeding results in a large increase of lateral forces. An increase from 20 to 25 miles per hour results in a 56 percent increase from 20,000 to over 31,000 pounds of lateral force. Even if the track structure can absorb the higher lateral forces, the wheel-to-rail friction will cause excessive rail wear and necessitate early rail replacement. In addition to curves, switches, and turnouts are other locations where high lateral forces may occur. A turnout or a switch has the same dynamic characteristics as a sharp curve, but it cannot be elevated to help compensate for the lateral forces generated by changing the direction of rolling stock. Also, because they're movable, switch points are not capable of being securely fastened to the ties with spikes and anchors. This makes the switch point more susceptible to shifting or turnover. Safe operation through a curve, switch, or turnout requires adherence to the designated speed if the track is to withstand and absorb the high lateral forces generated, thus avoiding wheel lift, wheel climb, or rail turnover. Particular care must also be exercised to avoid high buff or draft coupler forces while negotiating a turnout. High lateral forces developed by this action can easily cause rail turnover, wheel lift, or wheel climb. CSX air brake and train handling rules address procedures for minimizing these forces when operating over switches and turnouts, as well as when entering temporary speed restrictions. In our previous discussion of string lining and jackknifing, we found that the lateral force in a curve was due in part to draw bar force. Now when draw bar force, whether due to draft or buff, pass through the angles created between the couplers and the center line of the rail vehicle, lateral forces are created. Now the greater the coupler angle, the higher the lateral force becomes. When a long 89-foot car is coupled to a short car, 50 feet or less in length, the coupler angularity of the long car will be almost twice that of the short car. On a sharp curve, the coupler angularity of a short car coupled to a long car would be 7 degrees, resulting in a lateral force of over 6,000 pounds from 100,000 pounds of draw bar force. The coupler angularity of the car would be almost 14 degrees and a lateral force of over 23,000 pounds would result. If the long car were empty, the vertical force would be low and a wheel climb may result. CSX special instructions restrict the locations of long cars and trains on territories where long car, short car combinations may create critical lateral forces. 
The L over V ratio is an important indicator of potential derailment due to high lateral forces. However, there are other dynamic problems which can cause derailments that cannot be explained in terms of high lateral forces, or L over V ratios. These conditions are associated with harmonic rock, or truck hunting tendencies. These problems are not related to draw bar force and therefore exist independently from the car's location in the train. Harmonic rock, or harmonic roll, is the most serious problem, so let's consider this dynamic situation first. Harmonic rock or roll is the side-to-side -side rocking motion that shifts a car's weight alternately from one rail to the other. This problem is primarily related to high capacity, high center of gravity cars and can cause load shift, wear of truck components or derailment due to wheel climb or lift. The condition occurs most often on alternately staggered jointed rail where the truck centers of the cars are close to the joint spacing. When operating on this type of track with certain cars, speed should not be within the critical speed range of 14 to 21 miles per hour. To avoid harmonic rock, Trains must be operated at speeds outside the 14 to 21 miles per hour range in accordance with CSX restricted equipment rules and timetable special instructions. Truck hunting occurs at higher operating speeds than those causing harmonic rock. Now, the critical speed range for this occurrence is estimated to be above 45 miles per hour. Truck hunting is a complex interaction between cars and track, which causes the truck to weave usually with the flanges striking the rail. Truck hunting occurs most frequently with light cars having trucks equipped with roller bearings. It's most common at high speeds on tangent continuous welded rail. Truck hunting can become severe enough to cause wheel lift and derailment. It can be diminished by handling cars with truck hunting tendencies at slower speeds. Now that we have more or less described the forces involved in track train dynamics from a single car standpoint, Let's consider the forces involved for starting, slowing, or stopping a train and the role of the locomotive engineer in controlling these forces. Now we'll begin by discussing slack. There are two kinds of slack, free slack and spring slack. They work together. Now free slack is that which can run in or out without compressing draft gear springs. Spring slack is the additional amount that occurs when the draft gear springs are compressed. Slack action is created when one part of a train moves faster or slower than other parts. When this difference in speed is taken up all the slack with a run in or run out, portions of the train are forced to instantly attain a uniform speed. The resulting shock can lead to potentially excessive buff or draft forces. A run in of slack causes buff forces to be developed in a train. If the train is negotiating a curve or a turnout, the run-in of slack will develop lateral forces, which may result in jackknifing. A run-out of slack causes development of draft forces in a train. If the run-out of slack is severe, excessively high draft forces may develop, causing train separation. If a slack run-out occurs while a train is negotiating a curve or turnout, the draft forces will generate inward lateral forces, tending to streamline the train. Extreme care must be taken whenever a train is started in curved territory. When power must be used to start a train, use only sufficient throttle to start the train moving. Any advance of the throttle to accelerate the train must be made slowly, one notch at a time, since abrupt increases in draft forces can occur and may generate excessive inward lateral forces and lead to string lining. High horsepower locomotive consists and greater amounts of slack are characteristic of longer, heavier trains. Both of these factors can increase the possibility of high draft forces when starting. Now, these same characteristics increase the difficulty in controlling slack while running. They combine to increase the level of drawbar forces and consequently lateral forces that will result if proper control is not maintained. If you don't pay attention to draft and buff forces generated by slack action, there's a high potential for derailments, damage to track, equipment, or lading. The use of the dynamic brake to control speed concentrates the braking or retarding force at the head end of a train. This concentrated retarding force creates buff forces at the coupler, which must be controlled. 
Excessive buff force when combined with track curvature and other conditions can create high lateral forces. These forces in turn can result in a derailment. Therefore, there are practical limits to dynamic braking. Extreme care must be exercised in its use to avoid development of excessive concentrated buff forces. This is particularly true if the force occurs when negotiating turnouts, crossovers, or sharp curves, or if there are light cars or a long car, short car combination in the head portion of the train. The maximum retarding force developed in dynamic braking must not exceed approximately 250,000 pounds in order to avoid damage to draft gear and the development of excessive lateral forces. A modern high horsepower locomotive with standard range dynamic braking can develop up to 10,000 pounds of retarding force per traction motor at maximum amperage between 20 and 25 miles per hour. And 13,000 pounds of retarding force can be generated by locomotives equipped with high capacity dynamic braking. Our newest classes of locomotives, the AC high capacity locomotives, are capable of developing considerably greater amounts of retarding force per axle. A single six axle locomotive equipped with standard range dynamic brake can develop 60,000 pounds of retarding force at approximately 23 miles per hour. The retarding force lessens at speeds either above or below 23 miles per hour. However, retarding force is still developed and the dynamic brake may be used effectively for slowing, controlling, and stopping trains. Different classes of locomotives developed different levels of dynamic brake retarding forces. In order for the engineer to effectively limit dynamic brake retarding forces of a locomotive consist to 250,000 pounds, 